All right. Welcome to another episode of Movies Are Dead. Uh, Boris and I are here sitting, contemplating, you know, just how could we have missed this gorgeous movie called Smooth Talk? Right, Boris? Yeah, it's a good movie. This is probably one of my favorite movies we have reviewed. It's up there for me. I mean, you know, it's by uh, Joyce Chopra. Right, starring, based on a mm-hmm. based on a short story by jo- Joyce Carol Oates. Yep, 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 yep. It's uh, it's a funny thing. The story, short story, is only like fifteen or so pages. Really? Yeah, and it mostly focuses on the last what takes place in the last half hour of the movie. Really? Yeah, but at the same time, it takes a lot of character detail and even dialogue from the short story, and it sort of expands on it in the first hour of the movie mm-hmm. into a fuller portrait of um all the characters okay yeah i mean how would you describe the plot of this movie because for me it's like like the first half of this movie is just like a wandering adolescent story about laura dern's character in a small town in california right yeah it's true it's not very plot based it's uh, more mm-hmm. focusing on her character and sort of seeing as she it's sort of a coming coming of age story but not really in that traditional sort of like rom-com comedy way people usually make it. Oh, yeah, you're right. It's weird. Watching the first half of this movie, I was like, this is such an 80s movie. Mm -hmm. Like everything about it. Like even like the James Taylor songs playing, you know. Um, Who who else did the music for this? I think someone else did the music. I, I know James Taylor was like the director of the music. Yeah, Russ Kunkel and Bill Payne did the score. There you go. Yeah, very synthy, very atmospheric. You know, the yeah. light, so much mood lighting in this movie. Yeah. You know. It sort of seems like a, both like a memory and a nightmare at the same time. It does, yeah. This kind of looks like they filmed it on the back lot of like Back to the Future. Does it? Of Mill Valley. You know what I mean? Like of the 1955 Back sort to the of. Future set. It just looks like that, but I mean, it's like rural California out in the middle of nowhere it feels like they're in the south but then they're not in the south yeah i just like the whole setting of this movie it's like 80s mall culture meets like desolate isolation town it's weird i don't know yeah it's one of those small towns in california that you don't really don't get a lot of attention i guess yeah i mean it's not i forgot where they filmed it but like uh but definitely if you don't mean if you go outside los angeles and you go outside san francisco it's like desolation towns and small desert towns man yeah like simple folk people you know right it's uh, had the, the light has a very special quality to it almost like golden sort of like you wouldn't see these that kind of lighting in like coffee commercials maybe yeah no you would see this this, this, this movie looked like a 1985 uh what's that called um the coffee folgers folgers coffee yeah, there you folgers go. Down, yeah. it looks like exactly like that it does. It's funny because it just sort of draws you in because it draws you in with that sort of lighting making you think it's some sort of fantasy or idyllic yeah. life. It's, yeah. But the thing is that the whole story is constant conflict between Connie and her mother. Yeah. And then eventually in the last half hour, Arnold Friend shows up. And Played it, by Treat Williams. Treat Williams, of course. And Ellie, right? The guy in the car, Ellie. Ellie. <laughs> that guy's okay. great. Um. <laughs> we'll get to, the, I, I mean, okay, so for those people who have not seen this movie, check it out. That's the first thing we're going to say. And make it through the first 45 minutes. If you can make it through the, the first 45 minutes, the back half of this movie is so worth it. Like, it's, I can't even describe it. It, it felt like, like, the first half of the movie feels like a 1980s mall movie, like something like Fast Times at Richmond High. Sort of, yeah. Right? And then, like, the back half just turns into this David Lynch dark turn, like, weird dialogue-driven, something like almost like Sam Shepard would have written this, like, the back half of the movie, if I like. Yeah, maybe. Um, that's It feels like sort of like how life is, right? You're just going along, living your life, and then something terrifying happens to you, and immediately dangerous yeah. and you realize how fragile life Everything is and how is, right? easy it can turn dark. Yeah, yeah. Dark no, it sucks. Terrible. Yeah. yeah, like Laura Dern's character, Connie, like 
like her the first 40 minutes of this movie it's her it's her pretty much like wondering if like life or like the excitement of life exists outside of her settings right like her mm-hmm. friends are like these two girls that they go looking for boys right in the mall they stare at boys they lust for boys right And they have this idea of what a boy should be to them, right? And they're only like 15, 16 years old. And then Connie's sister, Mm -hmm. um, I forgot her name, but she works at the movies, right? And do you know She's actually a secretary for her high school, right? Was she? Yeah. And that's why she's so embarrassed by her because she has this like... Yeah, that's right. Frigid, so she thinks, upper (gasps) older sister. Yeah. So June, she's a secretary. Yeah, the... uh, Connie's high school and she mm-hmm. and the first time I saw her she seems like the little sister I know she, she's physically what's up smaller. with that okay first of all uh, how old is she she's like 22 or something 20, she has to be at least 22 right or 23 because yeah. Connie has that memory of them going to the football game on an autumn day right and she was like in high school and she was a part of the band right mm-hmm. so she has to be at least seven years older but it doesn't feel like that it looks like june is literally the little sister yeah. which i thought it or at least i thought they were like a year and a half apart or something it was weird no it's true because laura dern she's at least like a foot taller than like most people on screen that is true she she's is sort of like taller, yeah seems like she could beat anybody the up physicality yeah of her and uh, but yeah, when her sister comes in and tries to like talk to her in like this big sister sort of way, you sort of feel like what you doing, did, dude? It didn't like. I don't know if it was a miscast. I don't want to say it was a miscast. I, I don't, don't think, think so. it wasn't a miscast, but it just felt like it's funny, sort of. It is kind of funny. She looks like a little girl, kind of. It's yeah. weird, like it, like, and she's like giving this like sage, elderly advice to her little sister mm-hmm. in that one scene in the bedroom, right when they're mm-hmm. talking. I love that scene so much. That was such a after yeah, yeah. Connie gets slapped. She gets slapped by her mom, yeah. yeah, at the table, you know. But yeah, and then so her sister June, did she not intentionally remember that memory of them on the autumn day? I don't think she did intentionally. She I just forgot. Doing, yeah, I just forgot. But it meant so much to Connie, like that memory. It just that happens to me all the time. <laughs> I remember things people are like, "That happened." That is true. Some things just stick with you, right? Yeah, for and some with reason. Other people it just yeah, it's just like, drifts another by. day, another yeah, another experience. So okay, so she works at the school, and yeah, she, I think even her hairdo, like June's uh, hairdo, is like very like little sisterly too. There's something about her, but um, yeah, she's sort of um. I don't know what's the word. She just sort of, she's always lauded as the more responsible, more smart, uh, yeah. smarter sister. Respond. But then again, it's a seven year, six year age difference. I mean, helps let me think the, about this. Yeah. Helps with like uh, chores at home. Helps playing mom- carts. Yeah, that card scene cards. when Laura turns outside the house, looking in and sees them. Yeah. Yeah. There's that yeah. as well. Connie's obviously always alienated from the family, from her mom, especially from the dad. Cause he doesn't really care. He I, cares, I, okay, but okay, he just we'll, sort of like checks out. Well, hold on. We'll get to that in a sec. We'll okay. get to that in a sec. Because I just feel like with June, she was one of my favorite characters as well. I liked her so much, even though like the, the physical like presence of her was like literally in the shadow of Lord turned. Like, I just feel like what she did. I don't know. She just made the story like flow better. I, I'm not too sure. She didn't really give that that presence of like I'm the bigger sister. I am better than you. Like she actually loves Connie. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. It felt like she. Um, I don't know. She has has this like patronizing. Oh come on, Connie! You can do better. Sort you can of do attitude. better. Yeah, yeah that's why true, are you being yeah. so difficult with mom? Yeah. It's like she's a teenager. That's that's gonna happen with most teenagers. Yeah. Especially um, small town, you feel sort of alienated from the rest of your family. Like they don't, they don't really talk. They just sort of are together, and they just sort of like exist together. But they don't sort of they don't really communicate as trite as that sounds. They just don't. No, they don't. Yeah. Like especially like the mom feels like the mom has so much to say, but it just doesn't yeah. come out right. Oh yeah, she doesn't know how to talk to Connie really. No. Like when I think they're painting the house. Yeah, and it's a penny. She's like a penny. Yeah, he's like what? <laughs> like what are you talking about, mom? Ill. Like, <laughs> then she's like, "Oh, I sort of miss this." And yeah. He's like, what do you mean? You yeah. miss this? There's that irritated. Us Lord Dern's always irritated. She's like, yeah. "What? He's like, what do you want?" And um, but yeah, I mean, she's also sort of mean to Connie for uh, I don't know for not for no reason. 
but she's sort of like frustrated with the way she's living her life. I don't understand. I mean, I kind of understand that, but then I don't. I just feel like the mom was like, yeah, she was a little too hard on Connie. But I mean, it makes the story so much better, you know. And it's something like, yeah. like some, I, like there's that conflict, and then Levon Holmes' character as the dad, like. I just feel like that character, Levon Holm, it reminded me of Harry Dean standing in Pretty in Pink so much. You know, not intentionally absent-minded, but emotionally unavailable, I guess. Which is, I just think, I just assume that's just how men were up until probably like 10 years ago. <laughs> you know, they're still like that. Yeah, no, we still are, but it just not feels we. like... <laughs> <laughs> Got a mouse in your pocket? <laughs> <laughs> I just, like... It just feels like men w- were intentionally like brought up that way to be emotionally unavailable yeah, all the they time. Just can't handle anything with any related to emotion or yeah, or anything that's more than like hey, I have the Red Sox do or something, stuff like that. And you can tell that um, like that scene in the car when he and he picks her up and they're going to get the stuff for the barbecue and mm-hmm. then he's like I saw you with your friend crossing the road to the burger place where all the grown ups hang out grown ups as in like young adults older teenagers older teenagers yeah. kids in their 20s so he's like I saw you there you know does your mom know and then she lies to him she's like oh yeah and then that's it that's the end of the yeah. un- uncomfortable conversation I mean yeah he wants to I mean, like, it feels like dads that have teenage daughters want to be want to be the favorite. They don't want to be the one who like, or even sort of like Lady Bird. That's true. So yeah. they don't want to get involved too much because they don't want to like lose their favorite position or like they already feel alienated enough from their daughter. They don't want to like push her further push her away. Further, yeah, yeah. And it's just like the whole family and the whole town seems like it's sort of disconnected. Like it sort of seems like the only joy they get is from shopping. Shopping, eating, yeah, eating, all the all the nice pleasures of life. <laughs> Shopping and, and eating. It's funny that the sex, you know, right? Yeah, and then it's funny like the sort of the only really community based activity that happens in the movie is the barbecue. Yeah, the barbecue. And it's the one spot. that iconic. The barbecue, like the one her mom and dad and oh, sister no, go okay, to at the one, end, yeah. and that's the only thing that Connie doesn't go to. Go to. She refuses because no. she's fighting with her mom. Yeah. I, like, like the burger spot though, where all the young adults hang out, right? The spot. As yeah, but say. that's not really like a community. Like, it's oh, not we're it's, all here together. It's sort of like a hub though for kids to go to, kind of like the mall. And they, I don't know. Like, I used to watch those kind of scenes as a kid and be like, man, if only there was a place like that, you know. Mm-hmm. But now I watch it and I'm just like, man, I'm glad I never went to those places. It just feels like well, it's different now. It is different now, yeah. Th- I mean, that place was like the Instagram or the TikTok. You know what I yeah, mean? Or like going to a bar or a club or something. Going to a bar or a club, yeah. And then she meets that that kid, nerdy kid Jeff, who's a sophomore, right? Yeah. No, he graduated already. That's yeah. right. But he's interested in her, right? She's like Connie is like sought after so much by these guys, you know? Right. She like it's a good casting, right? It's Laura Dern that she was around the age of her character. Was she really 15? Yeah, she was like 15 or 16. Really? She just looks older, right? She looked really... Because she's, yeah. t- she's tall, she just sort of uh, has it just perceived differently by That's true. the men around her than her friends, Yeah, her sister. Even like the opening shot of the movie where, where they wake up on the beach, Connie yeah. and her two friends, like even like when she's just laying there, it doesn't look like a kid. Like it looks like a woman is laying there. And then like she rises and then her two friends rise and they're, they're like kids in comparison to her. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's just good casting. Great no, it casting. is great casting. Yeah. Also, um, yeah, no, she is a great performance. She's a great actor, and she's like, yeah, it's like from the beginning she knows how to modulate. Like, you can see her grow up, at least emotionally. You can. Specifically that scene in the shower. She gets out of the shower, and then she's, like, looking in the mirror. Mm-hmm. And she's, just, like, practicing saying hello. Yeah. And then she's like, <laughs> she's, like, trying out different voices and cadences, you know? like a mirror of that that scene from taxi driver or <laughs> the opposite though Lahane or something <laughs> are you looking at me that yeah but it's the opposite yeah, yeah sort of the opposite no yeah i agree it, to me this movie like it has all the components of a good 80s movie 
you know, even like Leave on Home, like a musician playing a dad. There's something like 80s, 90s about that. Or like even like in Pay It Forward, Bon Jovi as a stepdad. Remember I that? I remember Pay It Forward that long. <laughs> he has like a brief, he's like, he plays a brief role. Like it's a, it's a small role. And he has, and he comes out and you're like, is that Bon Jovi? And he's it's ridiculous. like, he's like five, seven, you know what I mean? Yeah. And you're like, and he's like, I forgot who plays opposite of him. Helen Hunt, I think. Yeah. It's She's Helen. the mom. Yeah. And he's just like this abusive, not nice guy to be around. And you're like, dude, he's like five, seven. Why is he so mean? You know what I mean? <laughs> but I feel like when like musicians come out in a movie, it immediately like, you're like, oh yeah. Like there's like this weird relatability, at least for me. Like, oh yeah, there's that person from here. You know what I mean? Like you, you know them from somewhere. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, Le- Levon Helm. Yeah. Levon. 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 Yeah, he. Uh, he's sort of balding, right? He's sort of. Kind of, yeah. Has that hunched over? I don't know how much performance, how much is him, but. You know, I think that was all him. Yeah. Sorry, a little bit like. I think that's him, though, I want to say, because this is the 80s, so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember the last waltz that well, but he sort of, like, hunches over the drums, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the last waltz was 12 years before, so. How old is he in this movie? That's what I want to know. He has to be at least, like, 45? When did this movie But he out? looks so old, though. 85 or 83? He was, like, 45. Right? Yeah. Because... Yeah, this was already, like, the band was already dissipated, so. Right, yeah. But yeah, he just, uh, that dad is just like such a familiar figure because if it he is. keeps showing up, I don't know if it's cliche, but he no. keeps showing up in different movies. Yeah. No, it is cliche, especially for the time. I just think that's how things were, even on TV. Uh, like that's how dads were. They're just like this absent-minded, yeah, almost like, like reading newspaper at the dinner table. Yeah, of, disconnected. Where's my beer? It's right in front of you. And he's yeah. like, oh yeah. Like, I remember my parents, dad. I don't know. After work, we would eat dinner and they would just watch TV. <laughs> Like that's just staring at it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is my question to you. Do you prefer the way things were back then or now? I don't know. What do you think? Do you look at these movies from the 80s and go like, people were more human back then, and at least they, they were at least talking to each other, at least not talking to each other at the dinner table, whereas in now, like, I went to dinner last night, and people were like, they had phones out. Like, families had phones out, and they weren't talking to each other. It's bizarre. And I was just like, is this how things are going to go down? You know what I mean? Like, is this the new thing, like new normal? Yeah. I don't know. Then why go to a dinner if you're not going to talk to people? That's what I don't understand. I mean, people are so fucked up in the head now. <laughs> They're so anxious and depressed mm-hmm. and feel so disconnected that they need some distraction, some sort of constant dopamine release. Okay. In the way of phones, through way of Instagram or TikTok or just going online and researching who was the 16th Archduke of Austria or something. It's something yeah. to keep you constantly Random, distracted, yeah. to keep you from thinking about something else, yeah. your life and the world you live in. So, like, with that being said, like, do you think Laura Dern, when she chooses not to go to the barbecue, like, do you think that's her, like, actually disconnecting from her family or, like, putting it to her mom? Like, Because she was, like, getting along with her dad before that yeah. scene. And then uh, it sort of seemed like she wanted to go. But then, like, her mom, I don't remember what she says, some, like, snide comments she makes. And then she's like, oh, and then they, like, start bickering. And then she's like, oh, not going anymore. Not going. It was such a, like, a small, recognizable human moment where they just sort of randomly start fighting. It's like this weird, like, throughout the movie, her and her mom have these little, like, fights. Mm -hmm. And they're, like, building up. And then finally, the the moment for the barbecue, for the leave, it just has this, like, Weird, like, well, I'm not going then. Yeah, and it seems so real you know? to me. That, and that's that. It was you like know? those like little fights you have that seem so real. And it's just a great scene, and that like leads the the story into like the next moment where we're like not introduced to Arnold friend, but like because up until then we see him, we see him randomly at that burger spot. Right, yeah, we see him once before, and he mm-hmm. says, "I he forget." He points what... at her, and he goes, "You." What is it? You're you're gonna I'm gonna get you or something? Yeah, you. Yeah. almost like you're next or something yeah it was weird but treat williams as arnold friend that that to me like like the introduction of his character by him pointing at laura dern at connie like yeah he says i'm watching you i'm watching you uh-huh. and obviously when you look at him they're like this is not one of the boys this is a natural man yeah you he's know 30 or something he looked super old like he said what he's 18 
right? Yeah, he, he's yeah, like, I'm he 18. says a bunch of things, yeah. Yeah, but even like Treat Williams, I don't know how old he was at the time. He was uh, 34. Was he 34? Yeah. Whoa, he actually looks like 34. Yeah. Yeah, he looks his age, yeah. Yeah, he looks his age. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, he sort of like has these like big aviator sunglasses that cover up his eyes. Yeah, like in Cool Hand Luke, the uh, yeah, sort of. the chain gang leader guy. But yeah. these glasses seem a lot bigger though. They seem like completely like block out any way you could yeah even, like get a look at him yeah and like his outfit he's wearing is like super 80s country it's like billy ray cyrus attire it's like cut off sleeves tight jeans boots yeah it's sort of antiquated you can tell he's older by the way he dresses yeah it's weird because he has it's like rock hudson meets like james dean yeah it's <laughs> definitely james dean sort of like a teen idol yeah of. teen idol you can connect that to the posters in Connie's bedroom. You know, yeah. She has a James That's Dean right. poster, That's right. Like I a think. huge one. Vertical. Yeah. Vertical poster. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then she has a Montgomery Cliff one, Blue Velvet, I think. Oh, does she? Yeah. Really? Montgomery Cliff? Yeah. I didn't see that one. It's either or. It's either one or the other. It's either way around. Okay. But yeah, um, it sort of connects this sort of like image of what a man's supposed to look like right. during that time period still. I don't know if during that time period it had changed into something else. It probably did because this story, the short story, was written in 1966, I think. Okay. And it was sort of inspired by Bob Dylan's um, "It's All Over Now," Baby, Baby Blue. Okay. And um, it sort of has that very 50s, 60s leftover quality to it, and that sort of yeah. seems out of date. No, yeah. Because you, w- I don't think teenage girls are still idolized James Dean back then. By 66, 65? By I like mean, 80, 85 when the movie came out. Oh, by the time, yeah, when 80, I mean, by the time 85 came out, I mean, or by the time it came out in 85, it mm. feels like, yeah, things were just a bit more, I mean, 85. I Bruce mean, Springsteen was a stud. That's all I know. Yeah. Was and we have Woody Prince and Madonna. Yeah, so I guess Madonna. maybe Bruce Springsteen kind of was kind of like channeling that in some way. I yeah. don't know. You know what I mean? Right? Because that's like born in the USA a year after. And he was yeah. like a teen idol sensation at the age of 34 or 33. Yeah, it's like in his late 30s, I think. Yeah. And um, yeah, I have no idea really. Like it was big back then. Like I want to say Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I think he wasn't yeah. that big yet. Yeah. In terms of masculinity, like men back then were just like, I don't know. It was... 80 seems to me like a lot of like big muscle. That's what I was about to say. Ma- like yeah. Macho. Much more masculine than the traditional 50s yeah. idol like James Dean or Brando. Even. I was thinking of Menudo for some reason, but yeah. I think Menudo came out a little after maybe. It was in that know. time period, I think. <laughs> um, but yeah, the idea of what a man should be changed. Like it seemed like during that year and after. Yeah. Do something that was more masculine. More masculine. Like you yeah. had hair metal bands, heavy metal. Yeah. I mean, but those guys were wearing like eyeliner and makeup. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was like it was changing. Into yeah. Like it was turning like, into that like actual Rose. Like yeah. by the end of that decade, maybe it was like at the actual Rose look. Right. Or like Nikki Six or something. Yeah. You know, those guys were hot. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I was reading something and then they mentioned that they found Keith Richards attractive. And that's like weird to me. Because. Besides, By that time, he was, what, in his 40s, 30s? Not even, like, in the 80s, but, like, back in the 70s. Oh, yeah. When they were more popular. Like, okay. that was who they thought of as attractive, which is weird because you don't think that now, right? I kind of do. I think, when I think back to that era, I mean, like, Mick Jagger, yeah. Keith Richards, yeah, like, okay. rock stars, yeah. I can picture that. But you're saying, like, by the time the, story, the, the short story was based on, like, 66, 65, that makes sense because, like, the the ideal man at that time, up until that mid sixties time period, was like John Wayne, James Dean, right, Rock Hudson, guys like that. I don't know something slightly more feminine. About yeah, them. and then it kind of it started to change once the hippie movement came around, where it was just like guys with long hair and like yeah, they let I mean? ugly guys be in movies for once. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. yeah. For some reason, I thought of Bruce. Walter Turner. Matthau. <laughs> Walter Matthau. Sorry, Walter. Rest in peace. But <laughs> I love Walter Matthau. Yeah, he had charisma. He had charisma. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, Albert, Albert, <laughs> Arnold Friend shows up in his Cadillac, another yep. symbol of fifties masculinity and status. And um, it's pink, right, or gold? I think it's a greenish gold, right? Yeah, it's something a, like that. Gold. It's a Cadillac. Is it? I don't think that's a Cadillac. Sorry. It's a convertible. Some uh, is it a Pontiac? Maybe it's a convertible. It's a convertible. It's a great looking car. It's yeah, a great ride. 
Uh, he rolls up in front of Connie's house mm-hmm. on a lazy Sunday after she's turned down the barbecue with family. Yeah. All the doors are open. Right? It's warm. She's, she plays the radio in all the rooms. So you have this like weird surround sound Dolby thing. Yeah. And all of a sudden, he just rolls up out of nowhere with this weirdo in the passenger seat, Ellie, yeah. who's said to be really shy. Yeah. He starts just like holding this radio. He's holding a radio on his shoulder. The, on his shoulder, listening staring to Staring straight it. ahead. Staring straight ahead. There, like, there's that moment where the car is like parked right in front of the house. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like this weird David Lynch moment where you just see this guy or like Cronenberg. Like, you know what I mean? Like the history of violence. Like he opens up a movie, uh, that movie like that. But like, it feels like the way this scene is set up, like from the get go, you know, something is not right here. Yeah. You know it it I mean? takes all these elements, like the convertible, 60s convertible, Arnold friend, Ellie. It seems so out of place in this time period and, in, yeah. and where they are that, yeah, it can only mean trouble. Right. Yeah. It's an mm-hmm. anachronistic sort of touch that, so that throws you off. Yeah. So during the last like 30, 40 minutes of this movie, it turns into this really dark, ominous like stage play almost. It doesn't feel like a like a part of the movie. Yeah. You know, it feel it feels like it feels like that could have been like a separate movie in some bizarre way. You know, treat Williams as Arnold, like the menacing determined look of like I'm going to have this woman is like disturbing watching it now. I'm pretty sure like back then they're like, no, this is disturbing and weird to watch. Right. But like watching it now, it's like really yeah, disturbing. I think to it watch. was always, it creeped me out. Man. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it just made me feel like strange. Yeah. Joyce Chopra before this movie was a documentary filmmaker. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, she does a great job with where she puts the camera and how she cuts it all together in a way that doesn't seem monotonous or even tedious or boring. No, you're right. The way that that last sequence plays out, like the camera choices yeah. and the editing, how it all flows together, specifically the shots to the screen door mm-hmm. between the two characters. Like, I like the way that's played out. Medium shot on both of them. And it's just like holding, you know. Right. It's just, um, I don't know. Not, everyone, not Most directors can't do that. They would like shoot a thirty-minute scene in a way that's not boring in a limited space. It's really just kind of it's worthy of studying if you're in, into that kind of thing. Anyone listening, yeah. just watching that over and over and just noticing why, yeah, she cuts and when she cuts, when she cuts, where yeah. the camera is, like human behavior in that sequence, yeah, is so strange. Especially love the shot where um Connie's hiding under the stairs, yeah. And he's the there in the, in the back, yeah. yeah and and she has a choice. Shadow. She has a choice to call the police, and she doesn't. Yeah. Oh yeah, because the implicit threat is that if she doesn't come out, is that he's gonna kill her and her whole family. Yeah. And that's made explicit in the short story, and to the benefit of the movie, it's more of a it's like Im- implicit open. threat. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like oh, he like he can tell what he means, what he means, and he wants if he, yeah. if she doesn't do this, and. um Kind of yes. turned like in cold blood or something. It was like, yeah. Like Capote's and I don't know. It's just. Yeah. It's sort of like this sort of like folky sort of horror. Yeah. In the country. Yeah. You don't, you can't really go like, yeah, like you can't run next door for help because the next door is like 15 minutes away or something. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, it has this, that whole sequence has this feeling of dread and slight sliver of hope. You hope she yeah. can get away. No, oh, yeah, shit. you're rooting for her to Definitely. at least like get out of the house. You're in, some in her way. shoes, and then he implies like I'm gonna burn down the house, like the outside. And, you know, he has that like weird little comment. He's yeah, like, runs if this house catches on fire, and I would burn it down. And it's just that creepy little moment. I can see why David Lynch casted Laura Dern in Blue Velvet, like right after this. She mm-hmm. just has that weird, like not weird, but like this innocence you wouldn't find in another actress. You know? Yeah. And also, like, the physicality of her body and, like, the way she, like, goes through a scene. You know what I mean? I, I don't know. Um, but, yeah, that last sequence, man, is creepy. Left me feeling strange. And, like... Yeah, that's good. You know, the choice of her getting in the car and mm-hmm. going and Ellie waits at the house and he's just, like, wandering. Ellie's, like, wandering around the house. And then she sees her dad in the driveway and they're, like, unpacking from the barbecue. 
and it feels like she has this wave of like relief and gratitude, right? For life, um, family. I think gratitude, life, family, and also like the idea of sex to her is sort of tainted. And I think yeah. it's sort of like like tainted, and then also like damaged. She has this; her innocence is lost. Definitely damaged. Yeah, the whole movie is about her trying to like figure out how the world works. Yeah. And most importantly, what do boys want from her? Right, right? how she relates to men. How she relates to men, yeah. She find, I don't know. I guess she finds out that men are predatory, for the most part, animals who are either either distant or they're interested because of what they can get from you. I agree. I, I kind of agree with that because you see with Levon Holmes' character, distant, emotionally unavailable. Yeah. And all the boys, they know they, they want her. You know yeah, I mean? it's like, like when they, Jeff, the nerdy graduate, you know. Yeah, it's like when she's flirting at the mall with all these other dudes. Yeah, it's not like they really care about her as a person. Or like those, like two. You can see that <laughs> it's a good contrast because like they run into those two really. Yeah, like gym dudes, obnoxious gym dudes. They're like you, Italian gym bros, yeah, like from that know. era. It was amazing. I love that scene so much. They're like, want a pizza, beer? Yeah, sort of like joint. Mr. Stallone's types. You want a joint? You know, and um, it's a like, it's a contrast between that kind of masculinity and Arnold Friend's kind of masculinity. Man, that Arnold Friend character is like probably one of my favorite like characters of the eighties movies. Yeah, I don't know. First That's... time watching this, I was like, you see him one time, then you're like, when's he gonna show up again? What's going on? Yeah, here? I know. They just throw it out there. Yeah, I like like the reason I watched this movie is because of the poster, which I thought was pretty great. The poster is appealing, man. And we were talking about this before we started. Yeah, the poster got mm-hmm. me. It, it, you know, the scene, the DVD cover. I was just like, oh, this is. I, I, I wrote it up as like, oh, this is just some like cheesy romantic comedy that that's on Criterion now. Let's check it out. Yeah. But then watching it, I'm just like, no, this is like a bizarre time period of like what sex means in America. I don't know. It, it was weird. Like this weird innocence, you know, innocent story. Yeah, and um. When you see Arnold French show up again the last half hour, and you're like, "Oh, what's gonna happen?" And like, I, I didn't know anything about this movie. I just, no, yeah, you know, like Laura Dern was in it, and like the poster. Yeah, I think to anyone listening, uh, <laughs> for our movie choices, like we don't really like, like when I do a movie for this, I don't look up anything. I just watch the movie. Like yeah. I just go in the blinded. You that's know how I, I mean? try to watch movies now. Yeah, that's the best way to watch a movie, mm-hmm. I think. Because you get something like Smooth Talk where I judge the movie by its cover and I'm just like, this is probably one of the best 80s movies I've seen. Definitely. It's, um, anyway, Arnold Friend <laughs> shows up and he's sort of very, uh, Haley disagrees. It's not the best movie of the 80s. Okay. But that's just me though. Hey, hey, what? hey, that's just me. Oh, okay. My bad, my bad. Uh, when Arnold the friend shows up, he's a, he's a talker, you know. He knows not he knows. He just sort of overwhelms Connie with yeah. what he's saying, and she says at some t- point, "Who talks like no one talks no, like that? Yeah, what are you no saying?" One talks like this. He talks in riddles and seduction yeah. and like open ended, like borderlining on like I'll kidnap you and murder you. <laughs> like it's like psychopathic narcissistic behavior mm-hmm. that like lures you in. He's like a perfect salesman it's it's so strange you know yeah that's right it's, that's a good word for it salesman and um sort of like all very empty language that's sort of meant to be seductive but you can tell that it's sort of like whenever you like read an ad in the newspaper you can tell it's <laughs> bullshit so you can tell it's like a nice sentiment but it's just here, here. <laughs> it's I being so. it's being used for something that's not to your benefit and yeah. um yeah, the the interesting thing about this movie is that, yeah, the short story was written in the 60s, and him talking that way made more sense than him talking that way in the 80s, where it just seems like he's like, he could be 60, but he has this body mm-hmm. of a 30 year old man. That's true. It's like a Benjamin Button type of thing. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> like it's weird. This character reminded me a lot of Martin Sheen from Badlands. Uh, Badlands, yeah, so definitely. much. Yeah. You know? He's a. Munchie and Badlands is much more dim. It's much more dim, tight-lipped, more like looks. Yeah, he's sort of like basing off his personality of, of, of things he's, he's seen he's on seen. TV and the radio and yeah. music. And Arnold Friend is sort of trying to keep up with the times. He's sort of like trying, trying to yeah. be hip he's trying, yeah, and relatable. It's, like, it's weird. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so here's another question I have. Okay, so do you think Arnold Friend is not real? 
Oh, yeah, it's interesting because in the short story, there's sort of you can read into it and sort of maybe believe that Arnold Friend is sort of like a de- the devil or some sort Tem- of some sort of like weird temptation. Yeah, some sort of like because in the I don't this isn't as clear in the movie, but in the short story, he sort of walks uncomfortably, and you can tell that because he like either he stuffs he stuffs his boots to seem taller. Or you can make the you can read into it that maybe he has goat hooves or something, and then he, he's not comfortable walking as a man. He's sort of like a familiar demon, like sort of entity okay. that sort of just wants to corrupt and seduce and destroy. Okay. And um, in the movie, I think he's definitely real. In either case, in the short story or the movie, he just sort of has this like sort of sociopathic personality where he has some semblance of good looks and a car and attitude and charm that he how did he know everything though that's my question too how does he know everything about her about the family leaving like did he have like a radio system did he like i just think he's been watching just watching okay okay yes sir like this obsessive mentality another question is okay her friend Uh uh i forgot who rolls up on her rolls up at connie's house on the bike and he goes there's this guy asking questions about oh, you yeah who is that guy because connie goes oh you're talking about jeff and then the friend doesn't really say anything i just took to be yeah it's arnold friend it's arnold friend right yeah that's who it is okay yeah yeah it's just um it's definitely real i feel like he He's feels real. real he just sort of seems like <laughs> you you like you meet one of those weirdos. It's kind of like reminding me of like Javier Bardem in No Country for Old Men, where you're just like, is this guy real? Yeah, like I don't Some know if you ever had the experience of like you meet a weirdo that everyone else seems to like, but you can tell they sort of have like this sort of charismatic way about them. Uh, no, it's just like, yeah, charismatic way about them. But the <laughs> thing is that you ever meet somebody and you just like you like tell something's off, like you don't trust this guy. Yeah. But everyone else seems to like him and think he's like he's a cool dude. And then later on, you find something out about them, and you're like, uh, okay, yeah, I've been vindicated. It's sort of like, or that. like they do something, and you're like, yeah, I had a feeling. Yeah, something yeah. like that, and that's the that's just part of life, I think, right? Yeah, you know, like how? there's always people like that in life where they present something to people and it charms them and it mm-hmm. seduces them, and then you kind of see them for what they are. Hopefully, you see them for what they are. You know what I mean? Yeah, but it's just um. I was going to say next. Uh, yeah, going back to that last sequence, it's like the whole thing is sort of like a cat and mouse game. It is a cat and mouse game. It just sort of feels, you feel sort of dread at the possibility that he's like backing her into the house. Yeah. Like initially, she's sort of open or curious at least. She's curious and to she, why he and showed she, up. She's curious and she wants him. Maybe. I mean, like, I don't think she really wants him. She's sort of like curious and like, why has this guy been so attracted to her? What is he it about? It felt like I don't Arnold really feel Friend like she really wants like, him. Ar- yeah, no, I feel because he's like, like so old. That's she's true. Sort of scared, of but then like place. I got the feeling that like Arnold Friend had her, and he could have seduced her, but he just talked way too much, <laughs> and I don't think so. he just ended up being creepy. I don't think so. I don't think he could have. Her facial, like Laura Dern's facial movements in that last sequence, are like moving, and like her the imp- like the expressions she gives on her face. She doesn't even have to say words, you know what I mean? And you get like to know where the story's going, you know? Yeah, it's a great performance that you can yeah. just track moment to moment just based on what's happening on her face. Yeah, yeah, a little like Joyce Chopra, like yeah. she made as you said couple documentary movies and they were like uh like reality based like she did joyce at 34 girls at 12 like these short documentaries and they were all about like reality what it means to be a woman in america right friendship uh the human experience in some way right so i felt like watching this like you could relate it to her other works you know and i feel like the way she started in film, like she started in film, like being like an assistant and like, she wanted to be an actress. And then she was like, I hate the audition process. So I'm going to become a director. Then she became an assistant for DA Pennybaker. 
right, on documentary movies, and she got into that, and she started making movies about, like, life, right? And I don't know. It feels like I don't know how many feature films she's done since, and I think this is her first one, right? I just mm-hmm. think, and it premiered at Sundance. I just feel like yeah, this movie is such a moving, like, like on the grand jury, grand prize. jury, right? Yeah, it's. I just felt like it's such a moving, like a moving film that I, I don't know. You don't really get these kind of movies in the '80s in some bizarre way. There's not that many of them, like in the mainstream. Because when you think of '80s movies, you think of like the the franchise hits, man, like Ghostbusters, Back to the Future, you know. The the big boys, right? Or like Spinal Tap. <laughs> you know what I mean? You get like these huge studio pictures, as they call them back in the day. But you also have these like little movies from like that same period of like, you know, something like uh, Smooth Talk, you know, something like, I don't know, like Rumblefish even, or like Year of the Dragon, or like Desert Hearts, or um, what year was Sex Life's Videotape? 89? 89. I mean, you just Paris, get these, Texas. these, like, yeah, Paris, Texas. Yeah, it was, like, after Heaven's Gate and all that. Yeah. The sort of, like, 70s personal filmmaking died out a little bit in favor of, um, whatchamacallit, you know, it's, like, studio features yeah. designed to make. The big bucks, yeah. The big bucks. And uh, these sort of little personal projects uh, got made, but they're not really talked about in the No, in they're the kind of just forgotten in some weird ways. Way. American filmmaking. Yeah. And it's too bad. Cause, yeah, you, you run into something like this that yeah. no one has ever told you about. You just sort of like have to stumble you into just, it. Yeah. Or like another movie we're going to talk about is Seven Beauties. That's, yeah, that's also one of those movies. That's one of those movies where I had no idea it existed until you told me. So, yeah. You know. And I feel the same way. Like, and it's uh, something I've discovered in like the last two or three years that, that I feel like I have like a full view of world cinema. Isn't that the best part, though? You think it's kind of like music, but I feel like the same way with like movies right now. It's like there's just so much out there and so much available. You're just like, Ugh, what else can I watch? It feels like I just watched everything, but then yeah. like you discover more stuff, and you're like, dude, there's just and it's fuck, great. There's just worlds. And yeah, the thing worlds, is that it's a, it's as good as the movies they tell you to watch in film school. Exactly. And you yeah. wonder why didn't you tell us about these movies, you fuckers? <laughs> All right, guys. With with that being said, <laughs> Bobo let out a, a grievance right there. But with that being said, Bobo stop joking. Uh, they, uh, Bobo, would, what, how many? How many would you recommend this movie? Definitely, yeah. Right, so I would it's too, a great man. movie. This is a, this is a great movie. I wish I could have seen this one in the theater with people. Yeah, because it feels like this is like this is what movies are made for. You know what I mean? This like. Yeah, you, yeah. If you watch this like a full audience, you could just feel the crowd shifting and like shifting, the last squirming, half hour, squirming, going like, whoa, laughing uncomfortably, shouting, my saying favorite. like something stupid that's kind of funny, <laughs> and the people laugh and they're like, oh no, shut up, yeah, stuff like that. Um, yeah. The thing is that I don't know. It's it's hard to get a, an audience full of people to watch this kind of movie now, but I hope it can still happen at least in small. No, I, yeah, I think there's circles an somewhere. There's an audience. There's audiences for it, but yeah. All right. Anything else? Last words? No, I think that the jo- Joyce Troper meant she made a great film. Yeah, it's so a that's beautiful all I'm uh, say. restoration. Oh, yeah, definitely. The captures of light. Yeah, I might purchase it on Criterion light. now. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, guys. Thanks for listening to out. another episode and check it out. It's a great yeah. movie, honestly. Um, all right. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for uh, listening to another episode of Movies. Are dead. Are dead. <laughs> <laughs>